The first item of business is consideration of business motion 11152 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a stage three timetable for the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press the request to speak button. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 11152. Formally moved. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 11152 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is members business debate on motion 10173 in the name of Fulton McGregor on UN International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And this debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Would those members who wish to speak in the debate please press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Fulton McGregor to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Nelson. Can I start by thanking colleagues uh, from across the chamber for supporting the motion allowing this important topic to be brought to the chamber today. And I think it's um, worthwhile putting on record um, my disappointment that, that the debate has been brought forward um, and, and I know that needs must and such as impact of Brexit on everything because I know um, for a fact that the, the amount of um, it, people that spoke to me about this debate prior to the, the change does not reflect the, uh, the, the current amount of people in the chamber. I've had the pleasure of presiding officer of chairing the cross-party group in racial equality since it was reformed at the election, after the election in 2016. And during that time, I've had the privilege of meeting and speaking with many people from throughout Scotland about the issues faced on a day-to-day -day basis by people from BEM communities. And I'd particularly like to thank the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights for their support with the cross-party group and for their help in pursuing and securing this debate. I'm delighted to note that many representatives from the cross-party group are, are in the gallery again, I think, affected by uh, the, the change in timings, but I think some have still managed to, to come along uh, and witness this issue being discussed in Scotland's Parliament. Presiding officer, today marks the 52nd anniversary of the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, established by the UN following the massacre of 69 people shot and killed by police at a peaceful demonstration against apartheid laws in Sharpeville, South Africa. Since the ratification of the International Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Dis Racial Discrimination in 1965, the UK, among 87 other nations, signed and committed to recognising the human rights and personal freedoms of all people, regardless of race, nationality or ethnicity. There have been major steps taken in the fight against racial discrimination since then, but how sad it is it that more than 50 years later, the problem hasn't been eradicated from our streets and workplaces. Despite good progress, there's still a huge amount of work to be done to rid ourselves of racism completely, and particularly casual, casual racism, even among senior public figures, including politicians. In 2016, the Council on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination called upon Scotland to strengthen its commitments to these very ideals. The Council recommended that the Scottish Government take steps to prevent hate crimes and racist bullying in schools, increase access to legal aid, improve the curriculum on the history of the British Empire and colonialism, particularly in regards to slavery, and to review the stop and search powers of law enforcement. As a result, the Scottish Government recently published the Race Equality Action Plan, outlining the steps the Scottish Government intends to take to promote racial equality in Scotland in a wide range of areas from employment to housing, to community cohesion and safety, to name a few. And I was grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for coming along to our most recent meeting of the cross-party group to update members on this plan. Recognising racism and establishing a national approach to eliminating racism in our society is a momentous step that I'm sure we can all stand behind. And this also at a time when Lord Brackadale is undertaking a review into hate crime legislation in Scotland. Presiding officer, in recent weeks, we have seen significant coverage of the racism experienced by elected officials in Scotland, calling us in to consider the reality of racism in not only our political system, but in wider Scottish society as well. If this is the sort of racist abuse faced by elected members, then what must other members of ethnic and cultural minority communities be facing? For example, a report from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service shows that racial crimes were the most commonly reported hate crime in the past year, with 3,349 charges reported. And while it would be easy to congratulate ourselves for having the lowest number of reported hate crimes in over 10 years, I would say that it's 3,349 charges too many. As elected representatives for a wide diversity of people, 
it is important for us to recognise that these are not only issues faced by members of minority ethnic communities. The CPG on racial equality in Scotland has also focused its attention on matters such as discrimination faced by gypsy travellers and poverty. And of course, over recent weeks, there has been much discussion in this chamber about sectarianism in Scotland and how we should best tackle this. But, presiding officer, there is much more to this picture. We need to look beyond to understand the inherent structures that perpetuate racism and prejudice in our society. A publication examining the link between ethnicity and poverty in Scotland found that overall poverty is higher among ethnic minority groups than within the majority white population and that there is a lack of inclusive services, including childcare, which take into account cultural and religious differences. To quote a report from the Equality and Human Rights Commission, if you are born into an ethnic minority household today, you are nearly four times more likely to be in a household that is overcrowded and up to twice as likely to be living in poverty and experiencing unemployment. Not only that, but people from ethnic minority communities, communities with qualifications equal to their majority white counterparts face greater barriers to finding work which matches their qualifications. This is a waste of talent and is completely unfair on the individuals concerned. And these inherent biases and injustices do nothing but hurt our society. And as I've mentioned in this chamber before, presiding officer, I'm dealing with a constituent case just now where that it would seem to be the case. Presiding officer, at the end of the day, we are all Scottish people of various cultural and racial backgrounds. We are part of the grand tapestry of Scotland. Everyone is part of an inclusive national identity. We are all equal citizens, united through our common shared national identity. As members of parliament, we must use our privilege as the voice of our constituents, towns, villages, cities and communities in Scotland as a whole to champion our nation as an international leader in challenging racial discrimination and progressing racial equality. Scotland has a proud history of challenging racial discrimination and we must share the honourable responsibility of carrying that forward. The Scottish Parliament should strive to be a leading international voice in reinforcing the support of our institutions to a world that is founded in justice, equality and human rights. And I'm pleased that we're taking steps to do that through the bold policies and legislation of this government and the formation of various cross-party groups, including the newly formed Tackling Islamophobia, eh, chaired by Anna Saba, MSP. Presiding officer, one of my main hopes in life is that the generations who follow us are looking at these matters during discussions in history, not in the present and fu in future. But I'd, I'd love my kids to be at school thinking, why did they even think this was ever an issue? But policies, legislation and cross-party groups will never be enough on their own to make that dream a reality. We all need to do our bit. In an ever-changing world where world leaders run campaigns about building barriers and walls and here the threat of Brexit threatens migration to our country, I will finish them with the motto of Bemis, which is a motto that I believe we should all adopt. There is only one race, the human race, diverse in its glorious nature. Thank you, President Officer. We move to the open debate. Can I have speeches of around four minutes, please? And I call Annie Wells to be followed by Tom Arthur. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And thank you to Fulton McGregor for bringing this important topic to the Chamber today. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak today on the UN International Day for Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Looking at this year's theme of pr promoting tolerance, unity and respect for diversity, I'd like to echo the sentiments of Fulton McGregor by insisting that we must continue to fight for true racial equality. Around one in eight people in this country are from Scotland's ethnic and cultural minority communities. Despite being part and parcel of the country's makeup, however, gross inequalities still exist. <clears throat> Politically, for example, just 1.2% of our councillors are from an ethnic minority community and economically, we know that those from these communities remain clustered into lower paid part-time jobs. Culturally, as we have seen with very recent high profile cases, Scotland is not immune from everyday racism that we so desperately need to stamp out. From the personal attacks online to the ignorant comments made in everyday conversation. In addressing these inequalities, I suggest that we must go back to basics. First and foremost, with understanding exactly where we are in terms of racial equality. In December last year, I spoke in the debate on the Scottish Government's Racial Equality Action Plan, during which I highlighted the need for vastly improved data collection in Scotland. Currently, we are behind the curve with gaps across the board. Due to time, I'm not able to name them all just now, 
but a few examples include voter registration figures by ethnicity, ethnicity, ethnicity of homicide victims, nationwide data on racist incidents in schools, ethnicity pay gap figures, and data on the uptake of mental health services based, based on ethnicity. If Scotland is not to take part in the UK race disparity audit, then I wish to renew my call for a robust approach to improve Scottish specific data and call on the Scottish Government for regular updates on how its equality evidence finder is progressing. Knowing what the statistics and being honest about our current stalemate will shine a light on the disparities that exist and drive progress. Racial discrimination, of course, transcends the bread and butter issues of life, education, employment and justice, which is why I wish to make a second point that societal and cultural attitudes also require our undivided attention. Discrimination can be embedded in our, our language through throwaway comments passed off as jokes and through as simple a thing as who it is we're seeing on the big screen. As we see in the wording of the International Convention, the definition of racial discrimination extends to include restriction, distinction and exclusion from the cultural and social spheres, creating an abundance of scenarios where racial discrimination can be missed. Just to give a brief idea of where we could focus on, education, of course, is key to creating a positive example of how children from an early age can embrace an inclusive national identity. And I am pleased that Bemis is working with Education Scotland to embrace race equality resources in the curriculum. And as highlighted as the in the organisation, it's important this extends beyond schools with large ethnic and cultural minority communities. Language too is paramount, which is why in preparation for today, I reflect on my own use of the phrase of the phrase such, phrases such as BME and questioned whether such abstract groupings can inadvertently create the impression of distance and other. It is important that we have these types of discussions and think more broadly about how we go about creating an inclusive national identity, one that genuinely embraces the cultural characteristics of everyone, from language to music, to create a positive picture of what diversity is. In doing so, we will shine a light on hidden discrimination and hopefully bring about real societal change. I wholeheartedly wish to work together as MSPs and parties to achieve this. And again, I would like to thank Fulton McGregor for bringing forward this debate today. Thank you. I call Tom Arthur to be followed by Anna Sarwar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wish to begin by thanking my colleague, uh, Fulton McGregor for securing this debate and I echo his uh, frustration that perhaps we weren't able to have it in the evening but it's important that it does go ahead. Um, as Fulton outlined the, um, the history of why we have UN International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination is well known. Um, it's 21st of March 1960 was of course the Sharpeville Massacre, um, a massacre of protesters protesting against the egregious and horrific pass laws um, which were fundamental uh, to the apartheid system in South Africa. Um, and I think it's, it's a very apropos as well that we should be having this debate because 2018 is, of course, the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but it is also the centenary year of the birth of Nelson Mandela. And indeed, it's the 25th anniversary of Mandela's visit to Glasgow. And I would just want to add my support to the... Nelson Mandela Scottish Memorial Foundation, which is campaigning under the uh, auspices of the legendary Brian Filling, our a, a honorary consul, uh, a consul for South Africa and a giant of the Scottish anti-apartheid uh, movement. Um, and I want to lend my support to that campaign because I, I think it's incredibly important that we recognise Mandela's contribution because one of the great actions that we have taken in, we took in Scotland in challenging apartheid was, of course, the renaming of uh, St George's Place to Nelson Mandela where, of course, the South African consulate was located. And what that, I think, speaks to a broader issue is Fulton mentioned about the structures of racism, but they're still the literal physical structures. If anyone who walks through Glasgow, Buchanan after Andrew Buchanan, Glassford after John Glassford, the very magnificent properties we see were financed from the most egregious 
uh, form of exploitation through slavery, uh, the most egregious racist system that ha has ever existed. And that's something um, that I think we must take cognizance of um, in recognising Scotland's colonial um, history. We can sometimes be uh, rather prone to slapping ourselves in the back and saying we're all Jack Thompson's bairns, but the legacy is hardwired into our own architecture, our own history, uh, certainly within my own constituency of Renfrewshire South, uh, Millican Park after James Millican, uh, the McDowells of Castle Semple and Loch Winner, the Houston family, all with prominent connections to the slave trade. And I think it's worthwhile, I think the, the lack of awareness of that um, and the lack of awareness of Scotland's history and connection amongst many people is something we do have to um, address. There is a specific point I want to pick up from Fulton's motion, and that is on the Race Equality Action Plan. Um, section 3 of that plan um, makes reference to health, and I think that's very important, and specifically with improving the uptake of HIV testing, especially in the African community. Uh, as a co-convener of the cross-party group on bloodborne viruses and sexual health, we have met with representatives and community workers from the African community who are doing tremendous work. I would also just want to highlight the importance of um, hepatitis C. This is a particular um, issue for our um, South Asian community. Uh, hepatitis C Trust suggests that prevalence of um, hepatitis C in the South Asian um, community in, in the UK is two to four percent, which is four to eight times higher than the rest of the population. So this again is, a, is an important issue to, uh, to take into consideration. It's something I'll certainly be highlighting in a members debate I'll be hosting later this year on HCV. The, the final point I would just make, want to make is that having looked to the past and considered Scotland's uh, past in regards to colonialism and, and racism, I think we have to realise that this is a present issue. Uh, my colleague Hamza Yusuf and Asawa have been subjected to horrific abuse and slurs and statements. And I stand united with Anis Sawa and Hamza Yusuf and everyone in opposing and uh, deploring that um, these actions and these words. And I think in a, the environment we are in looking forward in the in an age of a very sort of vitriolic populism in politics right across the globe where we are seeing uh, many communities and migrant communities be targeted and being attributed um, blame uh, for um, economic inequality. We must uh, redouble our efforts to um, eliminate racism and to eliminate it at its root cause. Thank you. I call Anna Sarwar to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Deputy Supreme Officer, and can I start by congratulating Fulton McGregor on securing this debate today and also by thanking him for his work with the cross-party group uh, on anti-racism. It's work that I look forward to continuing to do with him, uh, both part of the anti-racism CPG, but also through the CPG on tackling Islamophobia. Can I take this opportunity to say the message of solidarity to all our diverse communities here uh, in Scotland and indeed to all our communities right across the world who are victims of everyday prejudice, bias uh, or abuse. Because the reality is if we accept that everyday sexism and everyday homophobia exists in our country, which it does, then we must accept that everyday racism, everyday anti-Semitism and everyday Islamophobia is real too. And the vast majority of those cases, uh, it's not something criminal, it's not something you can report to the police, it's not something someone can be charged for but it still impacts on life chances, life opportunities, and life outcomes. And that's why we have got to look at ourselves in terms of our own individual behavior, but also ourselves as parliaments, as local authorities, and indeed our institutions, to see what more we can do to challenge everyday prejudice in all its forms. And as has been said by other speakers before, we can't leave these fights to individual communities themselves. We can't leave the fight for gender equality to women, we can't leave the fight on LGBT rights to the LGBT community. And just the same way, we can't leave the fight against anti-Semitism, racism, or Islamophobia to those individual communities too. We've got to see this as a collective fight, a collective fight for all of us, if we are generally to eradicate it from our um, communities. Um, how does it impact? I've mentioned the impacts in terms of criminality, but actually more of the impact is on access to, to education, educational outcomes, access to employment, um, pursuing the career pathway and promotion uh, at work access to public services. Uh, and that's why following um, the setting up of the cross-party group on tackling Islamophobia, 
Um, after speaking about some of my own experiences, I have sent detailed proposals uh, to the First Minister that I look forward to um, getting the response to, because this is an issue that goes way beyond party politics. This is not an issue where we're going to pick a fight with each other about our party colours. This is an issue that we have to be absolutely united as one on and speak out against. Um, I want to raise an issue um, that has come up in the last 24 hours um, because I think it's important that we say directly to all our institutions across Scotland, including political parties, my own, every political party, um, national, local government, to all our public services uh, and those institutions and indeed other organisations, wake up, wake up. Everyday racism is real. It's impacting on people every single day. None of us, none of us are immune to it. And in the last 24 hours, we have seen uh, reports of a Clyde FC footballer who made racial comments against an unathletic footballer in the beginning of January. His club has put a statement in the last 24 hours about what his punishment is going to be. I want to just repeat, and I apologise for the language I'm going to use, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, please don't swear. You can um, metaphorically bleep. I, 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 will, I will metaphorically bleep then, but um, l let me just repeat what was said. At the start of this match, Ali Love, a Clyde FC footballer, said to Rabin Amin, a, a Dutch-born Iraqi Kurdish footballer, before the game started, he asked him, are you black or white? During the game, he called him a PB. Uh, uh, you, you can probably guess what I'm referring to. When he was challenged during the match, he replied back to say, what, what will it be, you or I, after the game, or are you going to bring your P pals with you? The referee heard these comments. Other players heard these comments. It was included in the match report. An investigation took place, and the SFA took the decision to suspend him for five games. Now, managers get suspended for five games when they argue for the referee and are sent to the stand. This is a much more severe incident than just being suspended for five games. But in the last 24 hours, Clyde FC have said that they've conducted their own investigation and their punishment, they'll be sending Ali Love on diversity training. I'm sick to death of hearing diversity training being used as some kind of excuse or some kind of punishment. Diversity training should be mainstream for every single one of us. Ali Love should be suspended by his club, if not expelled altogether. We've got to send a message, particularly to our young people who will see these footballers as role models, that the time is up. The time for hateful views to be said in the open is up and indeed to express them privately is up as well. The time is up for all these people with these hateful views. I owe it to my children to make sure they don't grow up in a Scotland where racism exists. But actually, we owe it to all of our children to create a Scotland free of any form of hate or any form of prejudice. I call Patrick Harvey to be followed by Maurice Corey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by commending the, the speech we just heard from Anna Sawar. He, uh, as well as that, that powerful uh, later part of his speech, he, he began by saying that we should uh, express our solidarity and our good wishes to, to the diverse communities of Scotland. And as it's, uh, today is uh, Naraz Kurdish New Year, uh, I'd like to offer a, a special uh, good wishes to Scotland's Kurdish community in particular. Uh, and also to, to commend uh, Fulton uh, for bringing this debate to the Chamber, uh, for, for gaining cross-party support for it and, and giving us the opportunity uh, to, to have a debate on this, this topic. And I, I'd acknowledge also the work that is happening. The motion mentions the action plan and the framework and so on, the, the work that the government uh, and the minister, no doubt, will want to, to speak about that, the work the government is taking forward, uh, as well as some of the work that's being done on a cross-party basis here, the cross-party group on racial equality, and uh, uh, Anas Sawar also mentioned the cross-party group on uh, Islamophobia that he's just uh, initiated. Uh, welcome addition to the cross-party work that happens. And as several of us in the chamber are also members of the, the cross-party group on Govan Hill, I think it's worth reflecting on the, the level of community activism, such as the celebration of the Roma community on an annual basis uh, and throughout the year uh, in places like Govan Hill. It is absolutely vital that communities, vibrant community activism, not just politics, not just government and public services, local community leadership is part of the response to the rising tide of racism and intolerance in our society, and it is a rising tide, uh, regrettably. Uh, Fulton McGregor also mentioned, I think, that uh, 
Brexit impacts on everything that we do these days. I think it's worth saying very clearly that not for everybody who voted leave, because there are some who are delusional enough to think that there is an economic argument in favour of that project, but for others, the Brexit project has been fundamentally a racist project, predicated uh, on a hostility to immigrants or people they perceive to be immigrants, even if they were born here, uh, intolerance toward uh, migrant labor, intolerance toward asylum seekers and refugees. And it has come on the back of years of racist rhetoric in parts of our press uh, around those issues and against those people. We know that the referendum result itself provoked and triggered uh, an increase in hate crime and in particular in racist hate crime. I fear that we have to acknowledge the same thing is likely to happen when the Brexit project itself is completed and then again when UK governments attempt to impose more hostile, more anti-immigrant policies at a UK level. So while most of us I think would oppose that policy direction, we also need to recognise that this is being done now and we need to gear ourselves up uh, with the courage and the commitment to oppose what is likely to be a very challenging time, uh, a time in which we will continue to see a rising tide because it is not only the Brexit situation, the Brexit crisis, which has emboldened uh, those who take this view and who wish to propagate racism, but globally the impact of the Trump presidency has also emboldened those and given some form of, of perceived permission to those who want to propagate racism, white supremacy uh, and intolerant uh, attitudes and ideas. We see this not only in social media, uh, we see it quite, uh, as has been quite clearly and correctly stated in this debate, in people's communities, in people's lives on a daily basis uh, and I, I fear that it's going to get worse in the coming years ahead. I welcome the fact that we have the, the, the Brackadale review, the hate crime review that should have happened several years ago is now underway and hopefully coming toward a conclusion and some recommendations. I hope, and I have argued to Lord Brackadale, that we should be open to the question of whether far right language and imagery itself needs to be recognized uh, in terms uh, of hate crime. Uh, and I want to finish, presiding officer, uh, just by endorsing the, the comments that were made also at the end of Anna Sarwar's speech, that political parties, as well as other institutions in our society, it is not only, I know there's been recent high-profile discussion about uh, the Labour Party, it is by no means an issue which, which is predicated only on one political party. It's across our political spectrum, it's across our, our society and our political landscape, but every political party has a responsibility to take a zero-tolerance attitude, not only in re reaction to specific incidents, but also proactively uh, in making sure that we do not recruit as candidates people who need to be disciplined for these basic, uh, basic matters of, of decency and civility. Thank you very much. The last of the open debate contributions is from Maurice Corey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Resigning Officer. Uh, let me begin by thanking Fulton McGregor uh, for bringing today's uh, members' debate so that we could have the opportunity to properly mark the UN International Day for the Elimination of uh, Racial Discrimination. I think it would also be well-timed debate as well because we've only got to look to the recent high-profile case we've all heard of involving one of our colleagues, Humza Youssef, facing the Islamic phobic comments from elected councillor. Humza Usaf and Anna Sawa here today spoke very powerfully on the BBC at the weekend about the issues of racism and Islamic phobia and the threats and abuse they receive personally as public figures due to their race and religion. Injustice that no one should ever have to face at all today. It does show that we still have some distance to travel before we are finally able to say Scotland is free from this despicable form of discrimination. And back to the UN Day itself today. Today has been marked by, by the UN since 1966. The date, as already mentioned, of the 21st of March, which was chosen because of that day in 1960. Police opened fire and killed 69 people at a peaceful demonstration against the apartheid laws in Sharpville, South Africa. 
Proclaiming the day in 1966, the United Nations General Assembly called on the international community to redouble its efforts to eliminate all forms of racial discrimination. It is appropriate that this day is still marked in South Africa as Human Rights Days, which is a public holiday, and I'm sure everyone in this chamber would offer our support to them as they commemorate their lives that were lost so sadly during their lo long struggle for democracy, freedom, and hu equal human rights in their country during the apartheid regime. Since then, the UN has created the Durban Declaration, the program of action to address and track instances of discrimination around the world. Under this act, measures have been put in place for nations to report to this, on the state of equality and holding nations accountable to address issues that are evident. In April of 2009, the Durban Review Conference was held to look into how effective the act was performing. Individuals and organizations had the opportunity to speak about the state of racial and religious equality in their countries. And nevertheless, examples of racial discrimination do exist throughout the Commonwealth. And for instance, during the conference, uh, Khaled Hussein, a Bihari from Bangladesh, discussed the discrimination, discrimination he has faced as part of this community. The Bihari are not recognized by the public as citizens and face discrimination in schools and employment opportunities and have been living in camps throughout Bangladesh since the partition of Pakistan in 1971. Hussein, like many Baharis, are denied entry into the public school system and after primary school, forcing them to go to public school, which most Baharis cannot afford. And while attending private school, Hussein and his Bihari classmates were bullied and marginalized in the classroom. Nevertheless, he was lucky enough to get an education, while many of his peers were unable to do so, placing limits on the jobs they can hold. And while discrimination continues, hope was gained in 2003 when Bihari living in the camps were officially deemed Bangladeshi by the High Court, forcing the Electoral Commission to give them voting rights. This is just about one of the numerous accounts of racial or religious discrimination faced by citizens of the Commonwealth every day. And last week we celebrated Commonwealth Day and we reflected on the progress that has been made while also recognizing the progress still left to be made. In the case of racial discrimination, we must continue to work towards a fairer society throughout Scotland, the United Kingdom, and the Commonwealth as a whole, including United Nations. And in conclusion, <coughs> conclusion Deputy Designing Officer, promoting tolerance, inclusion, unity, and respect for diversity are the focus of International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination this year. And globally, there is still much progress to be made. Even with acts such as the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which nearly has global ratification, so many individuals and communities still face systematic discrimination based on their race and religion. With global cooperation, sharing tactics that have worked in individual countries and making a true effort to end racial and religious discrimination, then true progress can be made today. Thank you. I now call on Alistair Allen to respond to the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Presiding officer, can I thank uh, all members for their very considered and insightful contributions to the debate, and I thank particularly Fulton McGregor for bringing the motion to Parliament today. It is, of course, uh, fitting that we are discussing these matters on the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. The Scottish Government, uh, like the Scottish Parliament, is determined that Scotland should be doing all that it can to be uh, advancing race equality, tackling racism and addressing the barriers that prevent people from minority ethnic communities for re from realising their fullest potential. And it's uh, with that in mind that the uh, Race Equality Action Plan, which we published in December, restates our commitment to race equality and outlines the actions we'll take over the lifetime of this parliament to realize the ambitions set out in the race equality framework for Scotland published in March 2016. Now following the recommendation uh, of Kaliani Lyle, the independent race equality advisor, we are establishing a senior level program board which will meet quarterly to oversee the implementation of that action plan. And it's worth saying too that this year is of course uh, the year of young people and a group of minority ethnic, young, uh, minority ethnic young people have been working with the Scottish Government since April 2017 supported by Young Scot to co-design a fairer future for minority ethnic young people in Scotland. They published their report creating a fairer future in November. And most of the panel members had experienced some form of discrimination based on their ethnic background. And it is worth us reflecting on that in the midst of talking about government policy. 
that the government policy exists because of personal human experiences of unjustifiable uh, discrimination, uh, experiences which limit people's opportunities in their lives in our country. All that has a terrible impact on people and on families. And uh, we live in a time when, as Patrick Harvey uh, observed, some people do feel that uh, casual racism has been given political permission uh, from some quarters, whether it's here or in other countries. And we do need all of us as politicians and all parties to tackle that head on. And uh, as we heard today, part of that involves examining our past. Uh, part of that involves examining the history of the British Empire in a way perhaps that we don't often do, and indeed the role of Scots in the slave trade, as Tom Arthur alluded to, uh, even if that means uh, merely looking about us and learning the story behind some of our street names. As my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Communities, Social Security and Equalities announced earlier today, one of uh, our partners in the work that we do, Bemis, will be delivering a programme of local and national events aimed at involving minority ethnic young people in the Year of Young People. And Bemis, who have delivered strongly on previous themed years, uh, will receive around £70,000 for that project. This is in addition to the £2.6 million of funding we are providing to tackle racism and racial discrimination. We're also providing £500,000 for a new workplace equality fund which will support uh, innovative projects aimed at reducing barriers to employment for minority ethnic people, women, disabled people and older people. Now the Race Equality Advisors Report, Race Equality in Scotland, moving forward, highlighted that research shows that one particular, if I, one particular uh, community, if I can draw attention to them, um, faces particular uh, discrimination, and that is, is Scotland's gypsy travellers community. That's why in December 2017, the Cabinet Secretary for Communities, Social Security and Equalities announced that she was going to establish a ministerial working group on gypsy travellers specifically, which she would chair and which would be attended by the Ministers for Local Government and Housing, Childcare and Early Years, uh, Employability and Training and Public Health and Sport. The Cabinet Secretary and the Ministers on the Working Group have been visiting gypsy traveller sites and meeting members of that community. Engagement with the community will continue over the lifespan of the Working Group, not, not simply to ask what the problems are, um, we've probably done that already, but to check out with them the viability of solutions to those problems uh, which the working group develops. The actions more generally that we need to eradicate racism are, of course, not just for the Scottish Government alone. As Anna Sarwa rightly said, every individual and every organisation in Scotland needs to play their role in creating a fair and equal Scotland that protects and includes people from all backgrounds whatever their ethnicity may be. As Annie Wells and others observed, we cannot be complacent in Scotland. Just because we have not seen some of the issues which have been evident in other parts of the UK, as recent incidents have shown, Scotland is not immune from the phenomenon of public figures in our communities saying moronic things. Members of this parliament have been subjected to offensive comments and much worse because of their race or because of their religion. Strong action needs to be taken against all offenders and all political parties, all of us in this parliament, need to adopt a zero tolerance approach to these examples of racist hate crime. Let me finish with uh, a quote from Audre Lorde, the American writer and civil rights activist. It is not our differences that divide us, it is our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. We may look, sound, live differently, but we are, we are all people. We are all, as uh, Fulton McGregor said, Scots. We all live in this community together and we all deserve the same opportunities and to be able to make the same contribution as anyone else. The meeting is suspended until two o'clock.